here we are in the second chapter of Unit 7 for Envi AP Environmental Science. This one is going to talk about minerals and mining. So we've laid the basic groundwork for geology in our discussion of Chapter 2. We're going to look at how that relates to um, some of the resources that we really need on Earth um, through minerals and mining. So this is the kind of stuff we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to look at reclamation and mining policy, how we mine, the environmental and social impacts of mining, and if, see if we can do it sustainably. So this is um, one of the saddest case studies in the entire course, um, next to the palm oil case study from um, you know, with the orangutans. So the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, has been involved in awful, awful war and conflict um, since 1998 over um, a mineral called tantalum. And you can read the um, awful things that have happened in terms of civil rights and human rights um, in, in the, you know, the almost 30 years, 25 years since um, the conflict began. So why is tantalum important? Tantalum is really important in producing um, capacitors in a lot of uh, the electronics that we have. Most importantly, cell phones. Um, so because of all the fighting, uh, people are abandoning their homes. They're going into national parks to get, uh, to handle, you know, to get away from the uh, violence. Um, the threat of rape and all of those awful things. So they're moving into these national parks and they're causing issues in those national parks, including what you see here, um, destroying rainforests for fuel wood, um, killing rare and endangered animals for food. You know, when they clear the rainforests, that's gonna increase erosion rates around streams. And then um, if they wind up working in the tantalum mines and the tantalum operations themselves, you're gonna get toxic metals that run off um, <clears throat> into the streams and surrounding surface water um, from mining operations. Um, so it's a really bad scene. Um, from a human rights perspective, uh, the people that work in the tantalum mines get um, very, very little of the money um, that they sell the tantalum for because of the um, corrupt people who uh, are in the vicinity, the uh, soldiers, and then the rebels, they'll steal the tantalum um, and sell it to international traders. So um, <clears throat> what wound up happening, uh, there was a grassroots, grassroots movement that really encouraged an embargo on anything that came from areas uh, of the world with conflict, specifically the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, there was a peace treaty in 2002 um, that uh, helps to reduce conflict, but there are other black markets that have um, uh, emerged from minerals. So even though this is kind of settled a little bit in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, there's nothing to say that it can't happen again. Um, the case study I had would um, really show you guys some of the horrors of um, of being in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I may just post it for you guys to have access to, not for questions or anything. So mineral resources. We get, <laughs> Captain Obvious Statement, there it is. Um, we get lots and lots of mineral resources from the earth, okay? So gypsum is a mineral um, that is in um, sheetrock. It's gypsum board. Um, stuff in cosmetics, um, if you're soldering, like the joints in the uh, chairs, um, in classrooms and wherever you might be. That came from lead, which is a mineral. Um, all of the, salt is a mineral, right? Um, stuff in glasses, other things in steel, they're just everywhere. They're just everywhere. So we need minerals to have things that um, we enjoy, the, the comforts of our modern life. <clears throat> So we talked about um, rocks and minerals, okay? Um, minerals come from rocks. So a rock is a solid aggregation of minerals like we talked about in the last chapter. And a mineral is a naturally occurring solid with a definite composition and a definite internal structure. So when you go to get 
a resource from the ground. Sometimes the rock is the resource itself. Other times there are certain minerals within that rock because you guys know a rock is a bunch of minerals put together. Um, so that determines the amount of refining and processing that has to happen to um, the source material. How do we get them? We mine. <laughs> uh, mining is when you remove rock or soil or anything to get minerals of economic interest out of it, okay? Um, you can mine water, you can mine fossil fuels, but when we talk about mining in the strictest sense of the word, we're talking about um, pulling material out of rock or soil. So um, we're gonna use lots and lots of minerals throughout the course of our lives um, for every purpose in our lives. So whether it's you know building our homes, um, whether it's powering our vehicles or heating our homes, or you know in the food that we eat, um, we use minerals extensively as we saw in that first picture. So um, the metal you know that we need for lots of our processes and our mineral resources on the planet, um, metal is lustrous, opaque, and malleable, can conduct heat and electricity. So that's not a huge thing for our, the scope of our course, um, but the next part is. So you, if you are mining for aluminum, let's say, or coltan, which is um, the picture that you see there, you don't like dig down into the ground and find this big deposit of coltan or this big deposit of um, aluminum, right? You find an ore of aluminum, right? Or an ore of coltan. So um, it's, in, it's a group of minerals that are mixed together that we extract the metal from, okay? So coltan, um, you mine, you get coltan, and then from coltan, you get the tantalum. So from, um, from aluminum, if you wanna get aluminum, bauxite, B-A-U-X-I-T-E, is the ore and from bauxite, you get aluminum. So that's like the source rock. The ore is like the source rock. So um, again, when you pull ore out of the ground, it's not in a perfectly usable format. You have to pulverize it, so you gotta mash it up, you gotta wash it, um, and then you have to either physically or chemically extract the minerals. So one thing that you can do uh, one of the big processes that you can see here is smelting. So you heat beyond uh, a melting point, whatever the melting point of that ore is, and you combine it with other chemicals to help pull that metal out, to separate that metal. Um, you can um, put a metal, metal with a non-metal or a metal, metal with another metal to create an alloy um, through the smelting process. Um, Smelting and the processes that we use to pull ore out of the earth and, and um, refine ore um, are not really environmentally friendly. So they're very water intensive and they're energy intensive. Like to run that smelter in the previous picture, that takes a lot of, of energy, right? So it's, gonna, it's, got, it's gotta be a fuel source. So is it coal, is it natural gas, is it wood? What are they doing to create that heat? So it requires resources. Um, what comes out of it, like this guy is wearing the heat proof suit because it's really hot, but this stuff that's coming off of the smelting you know, area is not like nice to breathe. So there are toxic pollutants that can go into the atmosphere. Um, and then what's left, um, that water that you use to process the ore um, is gonna be polluted Okay, and then the solid material that's left, they call that tailings, okay? Um, the tailings are like the actual pieces of ore that are left over after you get everything that's left. So they talk about the tailings from mines. Um, it's the stuff that's like left behind. So um, that soil in the area can be polluted by tailings, especially when precipitation happens, and water can um, cause um, water can be polluted as a result of um, tailings as well. So we need these things, but it's a messy uh, process. 
So tailings are frequently stored um, in what in a big reservoir called a surface impoundment. Okay, so it's like a big lake. So this is a surface impoundment, um, and yeah, so this is the mine, and you can see like where they've been mining, and this is the impoundment. So um, sometimes we'll just put the tailings in there, right? Or they call it a tailings pond. Also, um, they'll put the tailings in there, and you know, natural precipitation is going to um, rain on it so it's going to turn into a water source um, if this is compromised right if the wall fails um, all of this now toxic contaminated polluted water is going to run down into natural aquatic ecosystems it can it can percolate down into the groundwater and contaminate local um, drinking water supplies um, the other thing they do uh, because they're kind of difficult to maintain, what they want to do is they want to line them like with some kind of plastic like they do um, the sanitary landfills that we talked about a couple units back. Um, but they're hard to maintain because this is toxic water. You don't want to go down there and, you know, check the status of the liner because of the um, circumstances under which this thing is, you know, the chemicals that are in there. It's not like going swimming in, in a lake or a pond. Um, so they can cause surface issues, the, the remnants. Um, we can also mine things that aren't metals. <clears throat> so sand and gravel um, are some of the most commonly mined mineral resources. If you have, you know, a stone driveway, that had to come from somewhere. So they probably blew it up and then um, broke it down into the right size. And then you went and got it at a quarry. Um, they're non-metallic, but we also use them for uh, making concrete. And up in like the Lehigh Valley area, right off of 78, there are quite a few um, concrete plants where they bring uh, sand and gravel in. Some other non-metallic minerals, gemstones, you know, like the jewelry we like to wear, uh, limestone, which is also part of making concrete, uh, salt, which is important for human consumption, and potash, which is part of what they use um, to improve gardens, are some other non-metallic minerals that we mine um, from the earth. So this is kind of cool. Um, you can look at all of the uh, economically useful mineral resources from around the world. Um, some of them are pretty important, like uranium is kind of important. Um, a lot of uranium comes from Australia, so does some tantalum, um, which you guys can, you know, take a look at this one. So if we look at the different ways we can mine, we can look at their impacts too. Spoiler alert, um, they're not really uh, nice to the environment when we mine because um, normally when you go looking for uh, an ore, it's found in a small place, right? So you have to move a lot of rock to get to what you're looking for, all right? So it disturbs really big areas of land, and depending on your mining method, it can result in really severe environmental impacts. And um, you guys will see them in the next few slides. Depending on the deposit that you're getting at or the nature of that deposit, um, you may not you may need to use more than one of these methods in order to get at what you're trying to get at. Okay, so the first thing is strip mining, all right, where they take layers of rock and soil off of the surface to expose the resource, okay? They use strip mining in a lot of cases um, for coal because coal, typically, depending on where you find it, um, the resource is shallow, so it's not very far down into the earth. Um, and the deposits are relatively horizontal. So if you just take layers of the surface off, eventually you'll get to um, the areas where your resource is found. So afterwards, after they pull all of you know, the resource out, they refill it with the stuff that they took out, and then they're gonna move on to the next strip. Strip mining causes issues, big surprise. Um, strip mining is gonna expose sulfide minerals, right? to the air where they weren't there before. Um, they weren't exposed before. And it's going to react with the oxygen and the water that's naturally out at the surface. 
And it's gonna create something called acid mine drainage because that reaction is gonna produce sulfuric acid, okay? Um, so a lot, uh, and we talked about this when we talked about point source pollution from water supplies. Um, acid mine drainage, you can pinpoint where it's coming from um, based on the mines that are around. The sulfuric acid is going to pull uh, metals out of the rocks. Um, so it's gonna essentially rust it and you're gonna get um, this orangey color, all right? So this is acid mine drainage coming through um, probably in this coal mine, it looks like. So the next method that we use to mine things out of the earth is subsurface mining. And this is what you think of when you think of like the coal mines in the Appalachians, okay? So they dig uh, a main shaft that goes vertical, okay? Um, and then from the main shaft, they dig uh, tunnels laterally out um, to follow the mineral deposit, okay? They either dig it or they blast it. <clears throat> a lot of the coal mines, um, early coal mines were dug and now more uh, recently they wind up blasting them. So um, this is dangerous to the workers, okay? Um, the workers who work in these subsurface mines are in danger from uh, the dynamite blasts. So a failed dynamite blast can cause a collapse. Um, it can also um, cause hearing loss because talk about like a source of noise pollution. Um, natural gas is often found with coal and other subsurface minerals. So you can have a natural gas explosion. Uh, the mine shaft might not have been dug appropriately. So the shaft itself could collapse or the tunnels could collapse. And um, people who wind up working in subsurface mines, especially coal mines, are gonna wind up breathing in toxic fumes and coal dust, okay? There's a, a well-documented um, affliction, you know, that coal miners wind up with. It's called black lung disease. So they breathe in coal dust and they, they wind up getting um, very, very sick as a result of their uh, employment. So um, even after operations are done, right as you have natural cracks in the rocks um, acid uh, subsurface mines can lead to acid mine drainage um, and old mines can collapse you know creating sinkholes at the surface and we are going to um, when we look at our um, key points we're definitely going to look at some pictures of centralia pennsylvania um, the mine the coal mines caught fire underground a really long time ago and they are still burning so they've abandoned the town um, for the most part, but you can like go and visit. It's kind of like the Chernobyl um, days in the exclusion zone. It's not quite that dramatic, obviously, because there are little kids running around in the picture, but you can go um, and see it. So the next kind of uh, mining method is called open pit mining. Um, this does such a number on the local environment. So basically they dig an entire giant hole, and I'm talking gigantic hole, um, in the surface and they pull out the ore and any rock that's there, all right? Um, this is a mining method that's used frequently when there's no real concentration, like a seam or anything like that for whatever you're trying to get out of the earth. So they just basically open up this massive hole in, um, in the earth and pull stuff out. So the open pit mines are terraced, right? So there's like steps down um, to allow workers and any, all of the machinery to move so that um, the mine can keep expanding and expanding and, and expanding as long as um, it can make a profit. Okay. So we're gonna talk about more, more about open pit mines when we get to the key points. Okay, so if you've ever seen um, like um, Gold Rush Alaska, not Gold Rush, yeah, Gold Rush Alaska, um, where they have the big mining trucks. All right, let me zoom in here. This is one of those big giant mining trucks. Okay. The ones where like the tires are six feet tall, right? Just as a sense of scale. This is one of those giant, giant trucks. So if I go back to a normal zoom, okay, you guys get a sense of how massive this pit is, right? 
Um, they're so big because of every all of the rock that has to move out to get to the ore that's there. All right, let me change this a little bit. All right, so they're huge, 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 huge. Um, once the mining is complete, um, you know, you've created this low spot <clears throat> in the earth, so water is going to naturally flow in that direction. Um, the mines can fill up with water, and you can have um, basically a giant toxic lake because of sulfuric acid and other metals that leach out of the surrounding, um, the surrounding ground. Uh, the Berkeley Copper, the Berkeley Pit is a copper mine in Montana. One of the biggest Superfund cleanup sites, the water has a pH of 2.2. Holy cow, talk about acidic. Definitely not some place you'd wanna go. So another kind of mining that they are um, looking at banning is something called mountaintop removal mining. So what they do, it's similar to strip mining, um, but they will completely blast off vertical feet of a mountain to um, get at <clears throat> an underground mineral seam. So before they do that, right, before they blow the top of the mountain off, assuming it's a, you know, a forested mountain, you know, a natural mountain, they have to clear cut all of the trees and clear the topsoil. So all of that material, um, that's called overburden, it's got a lot more volume than the original rock. So um, when they put it back on top of the mountain, um, some of it winds up running down into adjacent valleys. So that causes sediment pollution, right? It's gonna clog streams and rivers. And you're also gonna get acid mine runoff. Um, so this is probably one of the worst, environmentally, one of the worst methods that you can do. Um, it really intensifies erosion because, you know, the steeper the peak, the greater the risk for erosion. And you've now basically gotten rid of, not basically, you've gotten rid of all of the vegetation that's holding this land in place. So it's going to run downhill, right? So you have unstable slopes. So you're gonna get mass wasting and mudslides, flash flooding, and just a hot mess. Um, so they are really looking carefully at um, using this across the Appalachians, which is, one of the smarter things that the EPA has done in recent years. So another kind of mining is called placer mining. This is what they used uh, in the gold rush days out in California. <clears throat> so if you have metals and gems that are gonna accumulate in a river riverbed, you can use placer mining to, um, to get uh, at these deposits. So um, you take a scoop and you kind of like run water through it. Um, you can do it right on the side of a stream and it's gonna separate the higher density desirable minerals from the lower density sand and um, gravel. So in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, you see here, um, they are using placer mining um, to isolate that tantalite to make the coltan. So, I mean, it's not even like they're digging out with equipment in the earth, they're just doing it by hand. Um, which really makes uh, tantalum mining really not so fun or even like a good thing. Something else that they can do um, is they can use solution mining where they take um, hot water or acids or some other liquid. They can drill it down into the earth and then uh, pull it out. Basically, it's like making uh, a slurry, pulling it out, evaporating off the water or whatever liquid it is, um, and uh, getting the mineral out. So salt, it's one of the ways they uh, mine salt, lithium, you know, some other minerals listed here. You can um, mine the ocean to a degree. Uh, there's a lot of magnesium in the ocean, so um, you can, um, and sea salt too. You can like get this, the ocean water in a shallow area, let the water evaporate, um, and then scoop it out and refine it that way. <clears throat> there are other minerals um, that exist on the floor, uh, sea floor, and we'll talk about them when we get to um, our key points. 
Um, they have lots and lots of really, really useful minerals, um, but they're hard to get because they are down at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so we'll talk about that. So you've done your mining and the resource is no, it's no longer profitable to get the resource from that site. So what do you do? Okay. What you should do, what you now have to do by law, is restore the site. And that process, the process of restoring a mining site is called reclamation. Okay. So it's to get it to back to as close of a condition as it was before you started mining after you're done mining. So you got to get rid of any buildings or structures that you put in to mine, replace the overburden. So anything that you've chopped off, you have to put back. Um, fill in any mine shafts so you don't get sinkholes, and then replant vegetation so it can kind of um, be back to normal. The um, surface, the 1977 Surface Mining and Con Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act, makes it mandatory for U.S. companies to agree and have the funds to pay for reclamation before they approve mining. Right, so before you even start mining somewhere, you have to prove that you have the money to reclaim it, okay? Um, one thing that they're working on right now is trying to find plants and other vegetation that can handle um, life in a uh, reclaimed site, especially the acid runoff. So there's some uh, genetic engineering going on there. This blows my mind. This blows my mind. So in terms of where you can mine and who can mine, we are guided by a law from 1872. It's called the General Mining Act of 1872. General Mining Act of 1872 allows any U.S. citizen or any U.S. company that has permission to do business in the United States to stake a claim on a plot of public land that's open to mining. Okay, based on you know um, the Bureau of Land Management and all those things from um, a previous unit. So if they say you know the federal government says yes this land is mining, any person or any business can go and just mine. They can just go and they can mine. Okay, so it was it came out of the gold rush of uh, in California, but. The fact that it's from 1872 and it hasn't been changed um, kind of says that you know we're giving private people access to public resources for basically nothing. Um, so I can see that you know we are going to run out of mineral resources one day. Um, so why are we still sticking with this antiquated law? And it hasn't been revised. And people have tried since 1872. It's kind of crazy. Um, so we know mining itself is environmentally dangerous, right? Environmentally unfriendly. Um, we also have to look at the fact that these minerals that we're pulling out of the earth are non-renewable. Right? So we pull them out, we get, you know, X amount of bauxite out to get aluminum out. Eventually the bauxite's going to run out. It's a finite resource and it's non-renewable because of how the geologic processes, like we talked about in the last chapter, um, have formed these resources. So what do we do, right? So it, some ways to deal with the fact that these resources are non-renewable, we can reduce our waste and we can recover and recycle mineral resources, right? So um, the scrap industry is one way to deal with that, okay? Um, so those are some key things that we can use um, for, um, to use minerals sustainably. There we go. I said that too, all right? Um, indium and LCD screens might only be around for 30 more years. So. Do we find something to replace indium? Or do we develop a technology besides indium? It's the beauty of humanity. Um, 
mineral availability changes over time based on some factors. And this, this kind of makes sense based on our discussion of fossil fuels at the beginning of um, unit six, okay? So if we find a new resource, mineral availability is going to increase, okay? Um, if mineral resources decrease, then the price of it's gonna go up, so any technology that uses that mineral um, is gonna wind up increasing in price, okay? Um, so if also, if a mineral goes up in price, um, then you might have better technology developing to, in, to get more of that out, you know, if, it's, if demand goes up, okay? This is the, the one I said before, that changing technologies can either increase or decrease demand for certain minerals. Economically, right? If you have an economic recession, kind of like the one we're dealing with now, or a time of plenty, rates of consumption are gonna change. If there's no money flowing into the economy, you know, if people aren't working, no money's gonna flow into economy, we're not gonna be buying, so demand is gonna drop. Um, recycling is gonna become more of a thing, right? So if price increases, then, um, you know, it's gonna be more profitable for people to recycle what's there, especially if resources are more limited. So there's a lot that like determines how long a mineral deposit's gonna last. About 35% of our metals now in the United States uh, that wind up in the solid waste stream are recycled. So if we um, reduce consumption, right? If we increase that recycling, um, that's going to reduce energy consumption and it's going to reduce the ecological damage done by mining and processing. So that's really a good thing to do. Um, recycling rates, they're there, right? Copper um, is pretty frequently um, uh, recycled or scrapped. Um, Iron and steel also. It's kind of crazy. We can recycle, right? So instead of throwing your phone away, or like in, the, in my case, I have three, my last three phones sitting at home in drawers. Um, we could um, recycle them and um, you know, clear everything, restore it to factory settings, and then recycle it and um, only about 10% of them are recycled. It's probably a little higher now um, than it was when this came out, but um, they're really not recycled very often. So my friends, that is the um, end of our mining chapter. And then we will move into um, soil basics and agriculture.